Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing Live Show, number 394. I am your host, Lauren Gray. The mess behind us, but we are finally... Whoop, that's my dog, Edison. That um, we are finally past all of the replacement of the walls of from our hurricane damage. So now we are at a point that it's a matter of just piles of messes of extra strange. So pardon the lack of signage and studiesque looking things, but we are a little bit closer. Anyways, with that, let's get to our topic for discussion today. Um, it actually was uh, born out of a frustration email that was sent to me uh, by a young woman West Coast of uh, the United States in California, uh, where she was uh, participating in a couple of different seminars, webinars, seminars, presentations, and so forth. And she was, to say the least, disappointed. Uh, she felt that the content was, by the speakers, taken off of a shelf that was stale and old and put into context of presentations. Um, she uh, was was hearing, you know, she was looking at data that was dated 2019 and uh, graphs that were 2019. And uh, they were still talking about silos of departments and how that needs to change. And just like a time warp, really, of going back three years, the discussions we had pre to COVID uh, lockdown in some ways. And uh, uh, she also talked about the fact that there was no usable data. It was all about statistical impact of things, except for the one buzzword conversation, which was chat GPT. Like that was a buzzword of interest. Like because it's in the news, it was something to be discussed. But there was absolutely no, no, complete ambiguity as to what chat GPT uh, value proposition is. It's same, same type of uh, standoffish. Well, we'll have to see what that is and what the future holds for hospitality and basically rhetorical circular conversations. And she, can you talk a little bit about tech stacks and data of things that get used and how, how broken everything is? So I made the title today. This was a long explanation to the title of our conversation today. And that is the current state of hospitality tech stacks and why they are broken. <sighs> For the most part, if you're looking to, and then by the way, she gave me a compliment as we got a couple other compliments from people over time, of course, um, that we are very much on the front edge of discussions. Um, for instance, ChatGPT, while there's still people are sitting back because they really don't understand the functionality of it. They only are hearing the buzzwords and seeing what their people tell their people. Um, we've already talked about 19 different AI integrations into existing platforms that are functional for hospitality, actual tools and applications and processes and the usage of AI within them. Um, and yet people are still stuck on the start line for the most popular discussion, which is ChatGPT, which is actually one of the least engaging to our industry at this point because it's so broad in its perspective of value and usabilities. Um, so what I wanna talk about with tech stacks today, other than whine about outdated topics and, and websites and so forth, and then strangely, just to keep on that tangent for just a second, is a persistent problem. You'll see it in conferences coming up. You'll see people that will use buzzwords and front edge stuff and they'll throw, expect, actually, you're, I'm going to guarantee you that you go to any of these conferences coming up, high tech and everything else, um, AHLAs, same time as high tech, go figure that. Uh, someday they'll all get along. Um, you're going to hear a bunch about buzzy word stuff because it draws audiences. People are going to be like, I wonder what they're saying about that. Or yeah, I heard that's the latest thing. What are they, what are they going to do with it? And it's absolutely of no use. There is nothing about what they're going to say at a presentation that is going to be helpful for what you walk back in the door of your business to do. And I say that very critically because I'm the one that sits at the front row raising a hand because I figure if they're on stage and they're an authority of what they're speaking of, hence why they're on stage, that they should be able to fend questions about the limitation of their per, their opinion and perspective. I demanded of my audiences, I would expect them to think that they would get it from theirs. What you get is a lot of ishish. They're not going to share the secret sauce. They're not going to go over and give you how they do things or what they're doing at this particular moment. And that's why you'll see a lot of presentations that are historically based. They don't mind sharing what they did three years ago, because by now, if you haven't already been doing it, then doing it because they already did it three years ago means they're still ahead of you. They don't care about showing you their old techniques because in all honesty, they're old techniques. Nobody sits on a stage and tells you the latest thing that they're doing and how they should be doing it. I like to say I'm different and I do that because I like challenging it. And I look at it this way. I might, I prefer to hide in the wide open field. If I taught you something that made you able to succeed, the missing piece to your puzzle of what you're doing, 
then good. I'm still ahead of you for having done that, but I appreciate the fact that now I have a comrade that I can deal with, a, a, an equal peer that can come back to me and give feedback about their success. That's kind of what our hospitality marketing club is all about. We are sharing what we're doing now to have, have collaborate how to improve what each of us are doing now in a non-competitive environment with people that are knowledgeable what they're doing. It is absolutely an impressive conversation that we always have every week on our club. I'm not trying to pitch the club. Well, I am, but it's, it's, it's just, it's a value proposition compared to what's being pumped out there. These conferences, it will be fun to see people that I haven't seen in a long time. That's what the value of the conference is for me. Um, I do hope there's innovative and useful stuff. I hope I'm proven wrong, but most likely not. You'll hear buzz, 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 chat, GPT, buzz, 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 AI. And here's techniques of things from when we did them a while back so they're not damaging to us that you know about them now. There you go. Old updated topics. And that goes towards our tech stack issues. Our tech stack issues are because of old modalities, the politics of corporations, the sandboxes of de departmental titles and people, the uh, le level of ignorance ri risen to a certain level. Boy, I sound really negative today, don't I? But the idea is, is that people preserve their titles. People preserve their report, or their, their power of their title. Um, I often have said many times, if you don't care who gets credit, anything is possible. And I believe that. And when you have magical crews that you work with, that it's not about being able to say, I did this and look at me or whatever, but rather it gets solved. It's amazing the momentum and the ability to tackle massive issues and things that um, seemed uh, insurmountable. And especially by teams that are self-preservationists, impossible because self-preservation gets in the way of true team success. Quote me, uh, it's a thing. So with sandbox preservation, which is a polite way of saying, you know, departmental greed, my budget, my responsibilities, my tech, my tools, my stuff, silo, 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 which is an old term. We heard that a lot in some conferences recently um, that you're not going to get as far as here's what I got. Here's what I can do. Here's what we can contribute to. Those conversations breed success and amazing success. And the cultures and companies that do that are the ones that everybody envies. So if you're dealing with outdated data, outdated technology to handle that data, and, and when I say sandbox preservation, it goes into why you're still working with legacy platforms. Somebody golfed with somebody. It's a joke, but it's a reality. Uh, and sold them a contract for their platform. Their platform is an exclusive platform. Maybe it's a PMS platform. And even though they don't do the functionality of this other platform that you have, they'll charge you for the ability to communicate with them when it's really nothing more than a permission of, okay, we'll let them get these data fields, API stuff. But you pay through the nose for the development of the communication. What a crock. Anyways, and they make the promise, if they don't allow that connection, well, we're in the works of building a solution that will be better than that solution you want us to connect to. Smoke, absolute smoke. Nothing there. And I have the finger pointing of any brand that offers technology as evidence. There is not a single popular platform brand usage that doesn't do exactly the way I just described it. They may eventually make part that you desperately want to connect to integrated. It's quirky. It may or may not work. It may not certainly be as good as what you wanted to connect to to begin with. Um, or they, you know, they, they may eventually get to it. But in the meanwhile, all of that revenue that you lost from not having that functionality is nothing that they point out to you and say, well, here's a check for all the revenue that you should have gotten had we done it 18 months ago when you asked us. They're not going to do that. Instead, they're going to beat the chest and say, look, we listened to you. I know it's not half of what you were asking us to do, but it's what you asked us to do. I have been on those calls. I've been on those meetings. And it's, I, I, I mean, other than snorting in my coffee, that they're taking credit for something that's actually an embarrassment. But anyways, that brings us to the aspect of favoritistic purchases. Like I just mentioned, somebody playing golf with somebody. Um, that person that makes the decision, that inks it onto a, a permission that they have the authority to, doesn't have the actual awareness overall of the implications of accepting that package that they listen to the BS of the salesperson, glaze over the parts that are going to be problematic for them and highlighted the features that make them look like what they think is a rock star for having brought this service contract to fruition. Uh, and then it's left for everybody else to figure out how to fit a round global op into a square two, two level dimensional project level thing. It just, it, the pieces don't fit. They don't talk, they don't communicate. So then you get end arounds. You get 
hacks of reports where you extract data from one, put it into a format, extract data from another, put it into the same format, hoping you can connect the dots and you create all this. And then the, the, those people get chided for squandering time. Why does it take you so much time to generate this report that nobody looks at, but I asked you to make anyway? Why doesn't our platform do this? And when they complain about it, they're stuck in a hole of you're not a team player or you why are you picking on it? Why are you blaming something else? It's, it's your performance. It, it, the, these cycles of things that go on are just so mind-numbingly painful to watch. I get the, the displeasure of seeing this from a third perspective sometimes with organizations as they go through. But the, the idea that these are influences to what should be technologies, interface capabilities, tech stacks. If you're not familiar with the term tech stacks, it's the parts of PMS, CRM, CRS, these, these pieces that all of your systems work in. Their PMS, obviously, property management system. This is the engagement between your team and the guests as to reservations, guest folio, billings, and so forth. POS, you know, point of sale, tends to be for your food and beverages and or other ancillary services. Those two not talking together, painful, but unfortunately, very frequent. Then you have CRM, customer relationships, uh, management, uh, it, 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 your, your email sendings and being able to extract data from one platform and use it on another platform. And if they're not talking to each other, the manual necessity of doing that and the fraught errors of doing that. So tech stacks are about how all of these pieces form like a Tetris wall. They fit together so that they all can work together. There have been efforts like Oyo, you know, one-stop shop stuff. Um, Starwood, before it got put on the shelf with their uh, Valkyrie platform, tried to create all of this. Uh, you see the synexuses of the world, you know, the, the savers trying to be an all-in-one solution to the point of overcomplexity. They offer a tremendous amount of variations of what they can do. The problem is the knowledge base of keeping all of those things running and their constant flux of people and the constant flux of change of demands and customizations and so forth creates a Gideon's knot of complexity that sometimes the only way to cut through it is to literally cut through it. Right? You can't unravel it. Um, so tech stacks and why they're broken, these are the reasons why they're broken. It's not necessarily the individual technology. That in itself is bad because it is a, a, a cestuous lot of technology. You know, um, my IQWare platform, messed as it is, uh, doesn't talk to my CRM system over here, even though it's supposed to. Synexus doesn't talk to this. Uh, my meta doesn't do this. That's because they're not allowed to. Uh, there's plenty of platforms just from the user side that provide wonderful solutions for despairing uh, software systems to communicate data. There, there's things called Pabli, there's things called Zappy, there's called IFTTT um, that literally say, identify your data fields on your side, on, on, on software A, and identify the data fields on software B, create the ability to take the data fields that are labeled in software A and translate them to the data fields of software B so that the two can talk the same language. That's on a fundamental, just small software level. You would think with the brains that are behind some of these large platforms, it's a great given that they could easily create that aloud. And that's the caveat with conferences coming up like high tech and so forth in June, I know we're a few months away. Uh, one of the things, the pitfalls of people going new to the conferences is they'll listen to a pitch from a software company and they'll talk about all the things they can connect to anything. It's true. They can. Are they allowed to connect to anything? That's the thing. And more importantly, do they have an example of already having been connected to anything? And those are the two hard questions that you need to ask. If you ask the uh, booth candy, the people that are there because they're a warm body and they smile and they, they engage people, um, they're going to direct you to the one person that actually has answers and they're going to talk around the question like a politician. Well, given this, if this was capable, if you had this type of level of engagement with them and you had this kind of with us and we could go and create this and if we could identify these things, mm -mm, yes or no, can you or can't you, based on what they do versus what you do. They don't tend to tell you a clean answer with that. And the and the platforms that do, those are the ones you want to spend time with and talk to them. Because there are some out there. I mean, I'm bashing everybody, but the reality of it is there are platforms out there that have taken to heart what we're complaining about and have tried to create those engagements. Problem is, is that, from a scalability point of view, they're either swallowed up by large corporations, larger entities, and then shelved or integrated into theirs to a poor end, or they're struggling, you know, Samson, I mean, uh, David versus uh, Goliath, where very few people know about them and their capabilities. I've watched some really good platforms get swallowed up by very large platforms. 
And I watched some very bad platforms swallow up and make disappear other platforms. And it's to keep their viability of what they're offering compared to a competition. Remove your competition. We see it in capitalism all the time. And that's what happens a lot too. Now, things that affect our tech stack capabilities and why they're broken, shiny object syndrome. And believe me, I am calling the kettle black when I refer to this. Shiny object syndrome is literally what's the next toy? What is the next thing that's the new thing, that's the, uh, uh, the up and coming thing that we can do? It is by far the worst. Now, in the times where we had Stuart Butler on before he turned rich and famous running Myrtle Beach, uh, he would always be, would mind me on my crazy, zany, newness stuff. That's great, but that's not the first thing you should do. And I would always agree with him. So I always had the disclaimer when I was talking about new stuff. If you're doing all the stuff you should be doing already, then this is something interesting to consider. And that's how we should be treating shiny object stuff. But it's a matter of um, being a kid with the new clothes in the playground or the latest toy on the playground or as a, as a, you know, going to a club and having the fancy car, whatever it is, you want to show off. And everybody does that, that are in a position of responsibility for a large company. They want to say, well, I have, I've been using chat GPT and our booking engine for such and such. They want, and it's a shiny, it doesn't work. It's stupid. See, brands fall into that trap all the time. Our, our, our keyless entry says, yes, out of the 18,000 hotels you have, 200 of them have this capability. And yes, if you wanted to have keyless system, if it even worked, which most of the time it didn't, I'm not going to name the name, the brand, but being with an H, um, it didn't work half the time anyway. And then Mary, I went through the same route and it had the same issues because it was a new, a, a new technology. It takes time, it takes glitches. It takes being put into the wild to find out what creates problems. Um, just asked Apple about their app store when it first rolled out. They, they had a, at the, up to that point, they had a little brick of a piece of glass that was being mocked, put onto the side of their ear. And then they turned into the dominant phone developer of all time in that sense, technology wise, you know, Android caught up. The idea is that shiny object syndrome creates problems because rather than doing the things that in, in financing and in establishing the, the core things you should be doing about your about your analytics, about your advertising campaigns, about your modes of communication, the integrations of channels, the communication of, of your platforms, tech stock integration, you're running off and chasing crypto, Bitcoin, uh, blockchain, um, any of these buzzwords sound familiar? Um, artificial intelligence chats. Just throw them in a big pile. They're all buzzwords. Blockchain is a wonderful technology. Is it useful now for hospitality? Not as much as we would like it to be, but it's not. Uh, crypto, well, we know where that went for. Is it going to come back? Well, who knows? But it, it talked two years ago, you couldn't get around the conversation. Everybody had to be asked about a conversation. I've been on calls where the first comment, the topic was crypto. What a useless amount of conversation because it was all about hypothetical opinions. That's a double negative because there's that both of them don't have to be supported by truth and, and accuracy, which brings us to chat because chat GPT is not based on truth and accuracy either. It's based on data, data that's given to it. That's the data it uses. Um, we're already beginning to see wrinkles to things. Bing is beginning to limit what kind of questions can be asked of it because of course the newsworthiness of some of the responses, the open-endedness of the questions. You have very smart people asking very smart questions and you have uh, an AI that's responding that it was created for and the data that it has available. Mm -hmm. So, Going back to our fun discussion, bashing everybody on. Shiny object syndrome, huge problem with technology. Rather than actually improve the functionality of your tech stack, you just want to just buy the new shiny Porsche, even though you need a, a SUV or a minivan to get the kids and the family around for grocery shopping. Um, the lack of real progression. That's a, a point I wanted to make too. Progression is... This always perpetual self-evaluation. Unfortunately, the, the self-evaluation is usually on the merits of um, vendor retainership. Every year, most vendors, because they, the, the people in power are being pandered to by other vendors that don't have contracts, uh, to get in their ear about, well, we do that better than those people that you have right now do it. And we'll do it cheaper than those people probably are charging you right now. Or I bet you're having this issue with them and so forth and so on. 
And so they get in the ear and then there's vendor comparisons. Like, well, you know, we should evaluate. Are we working with the right vendor? Great question, wrong question. The question you need to be asking is, are we getting everything that we think we need with the vendor we have? Are we asking the right questions of our vendor? And self-evaluatively is, are we totally utilizing what we're paying for? I don't know how many times in any auditing relationship I have that I get asked a lot to do. The first thing I find out is there's nobody skill trained on the platforms they're currently using. Um, oh, there's Ed. Hold on. Ed can join us. I can, I'm can. going to send Ed a little link to this. Hold on, Ed. I'm going to find my link and send this to you. Uh, I think this is it. Love to have Ed come on in. Let's see. Let's go get him on top. So anyway, while I'm getting this over to Ed, the idea is that nobody is really, let's see if this works for you, Ed. Boom. See if that works. Hopefully that works. See if he can join us. Anywho, where was I? I lost contracts. So I'm so excited to think that Ed's going to pop on and we're going to bash the world together. Um, the idea that uh, progression of refining and training your people so that they're using the full utilization of your software. The, 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 the painful part of this is, um, and, and Bonnie Buckheiser, who I used to go on tour circuit wise, speaking for HSMAI, we went to 33 cities together, so forth and so on. She, she's the one that coined this phrase. She coined this as um, a Xerox training. The, the first person that gets trained on the platform retains about 40% of that, what they get trained. And then they turn it, there's Ed. Come on, Ed. I'm in the world of back in the world. Are you in for it, man? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm all about it. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, had, I had a meeting shift and I started watching the live stream and saw what you were talking about. I'm like, hey, I like this topic. I, I like this topic. I like shiny yeah, objects. Yeah. I mean, I, I've so far, I've been, so I made the topic of the current state of hospitality tech stacks and why they're broken. I've already bashed people on outdated topics. Um, Bias, sandbox, uh, sandbox preservation of their, their title in the department, favoritistic purchasing, uh, shiny objects. And then I was talking about the lack of real progression uh, when it comes to training. The fact that they actually don't even know the product they have in their own pocket. But I'm going to, I've been talking. You go ahead. So <laughs> I, I think it's interesting. So first of all, when you talked about the, like the problems that exist, uh, did you talk about that, you know, most connections that vendors make together are a minimum viable checkbox to say that they're connected? Did not say it exactly that way. Just mentioned the fact that they just don't like doing that. Mostly, <laughs> I don't think it's. I, I I don't think it's that they don't like doing it. I think it's um they're very task oriented. Mm. I need to be able to say that I have a connection to this thing, so I'm going to do it the minimum viable way, and then they tend to just not go back to it, right? And the and customers tend not to challenge them to uh to to make it better. Mm -hmm. Um. So, you know, I think that's one of the, the challenges. Um, talking to, you know, one other thing I'd throw in there on how to avoid shiny object or, or buying the wrong thing is you have vendors. Like, ask your vendors, like, who does a good job of solving these things? And just know that at some point you're going to have to filter whether or not the vendor's telling you about someone because there's benefit in it for them or not. But you can at least get information that way as well to make sure you at least know about what are the different options that exist mm -hmm. in whatever problem you're trying to solve mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know i i think those are just two interesting things to add on on that side of things yeah i, I agree, agree with you especially the minimal viable one and it's a great point to make because in all honesty the the it's like saying i was in philadelphia no you landed with a plane and made a connecting flight you weren't really in philadelphia you're at the airport and yes technically been to philly <laughs> yeah i've been to philly no you haven't been to philly <laughs> but it, it is true that they and and usually sometimes because of the people that are asking it in the organization they don't even know what they're asking they, they somebody right. made them go fetch and say does that connect with such and such and they ask the question and the person on the other end is like yes yes it does this one thing <laughs> yeah generally yes <laughs> unless it's not sunny and yeah yeah there's there's, there's right, it, right. it is yeah but i also think um you know this is where good vendors 
why they're good vendors and they do well. There are a lot of great vendors out there yes. that know this industry incredibly well and are an amazing resource, you know, even outside their lane of, you know, what's good, what's out there, what's interesting, who's doing interesting things with different products, like from a use side of things. Um, and then also talking to other you know, companies like yours that have maybe already solved these issues or don't have these issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I don't think we go outside enough to, no. to, in our research. I think we just kind of Google it and then maybe ask one or two people and then just start moving with what do I buy versus even taking a moment and understand what are my goals? Mm -hmm. Right. I think it, it's strange enough, but I, I always kind of equate it to relationship stuff. If it, it, whenever there's a question about the relationship, there's one or two ways that people react like, oh my God, the whole thing's in question, or what can we improve that is raising this concern? And I have to, some clients that we work with, uh, they're very good about saying, hey, we're not, we, we're not saying we have a problem with you. We just want to understand that we're doing everything we're supposed to do with you. So we're going to ask, we evaluate, is there everything being connected correctly? Is everything being functioned at its full level? Is there anything right. that we should be considering? And not for the vendor to take it of a, oh, we're under attack. We have to, you know, and, and respond like they're going to lose everything if they don't. Uh, it, sometimes it's, it's good to have a third per party come step in and help and evaluate and also it's a chance for the vendor to realize that it can re-educate the, the client on what they do, which is a, like I was moaning about just a minute ago, that training perspective, you know, it dilutes over time, especially if through transitions of staff, it doesn't get conveyed to its full potential. Next thing right. you know, two generations in, and they don't know why their system doesn't do something. And it must be the whole system. We got to throw it on by a new one. And it's fact that nobody knows what it is to make it work. Well, it's my favorite thing, my go-to. Whenever someone asks me about changing property management systems, I ask them, have you made a list of what you dislike about your current one? I thought about you when I made that comment, actually, because you yeah, know the one And the answer is almost always no. They know generally the things they dislike. Um, so then I encourage them. I said, listen, before you do anything, before you waste any time, make a list of every pain point that you have and send it to your current property management system. And often what you find out is you're just on an old version or okay. you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, and then boom, you don't have to change property management systems. Um, you know, this is, this is something I think, um, you know, it is challenging in a world where everyone's wearing multiple hats at the hotel is taking that time to sit down and think, what am I trying to do? What are my goals? And what are my goals in doing this? Now, that being said, I don't want to put this all, you know, on one side or the other. Um, you know, vendors can build things knowing how hotels work, yes. right? And they can either do that for evil or for good. Uh, the ones that do it for good build stuff that carries value, even if you only use a portion of it, because let's be honest, I think if you asked every hotel, do you maximize, you know, even your core systems capabilities, they'll say, no, no, we don't even come close to using it to what it could do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, vendors who build things that are designed to require that as a, you know, as a point of success, it ends up being a point of failure because hotels just aren't going to do it consistently. They can't, they have, they're not staffed appropriately. They have a million other things they have to take care of. It's, it's just unrealistic. Good vendors build stuff that will work with little to no effort um, and will scream. Their architecture will scream when you're ignoring it and there's opportunity, right? And there's mm -hmm. lots of good examples of really well-designed solutions that do those types of things. I'll even, I'll even add a, a small complaint to a vendor side of things. They sometimes move on. I mean, I've always had this complaint that the A team pitches it, but the B, the B or D team is the one that's responsible for what it does afterwards. And a lot of times the people that are held as the account manager aren't really fully fluent in their platform's capabilities and functionalities. So they stop asking the right questions to the vendor who, I mean, to the client who also after the A team talks to the A team that signs the checks goes down to a D team or something that's responsible for the functionality. And so they're being handed something that they didn't get to be a part of the presentation. They don't right. know the whole thing of it. They may not be up to speed on what the whole platform is supposed to do. The platform representative isn't fully fluent as to what they do or don't know about it. It's an assumption on both sides. And the yep. next thing you know, it's, it's already started wrong. It's, it's in two different directions already. And then uh, they don't, they're afraid to ask questions. The vendor is of, 
what else do you see or what else do you need? Because they're afraid that it's opening a door of criticism. Like, oh, well, now that you've asked that, let me tell you all the other crap that we don't like. And they go off on these different tangents. I would think that good relationships, like the way you described it, is that you know the vendor goes over and says, I didn't know you need, that you needed that. Or I didn't know. We have a whole project working on that way. Man, we'll add you right to it because we're right. working on that right now. You know, that's when the conversations are fun. And that's when the, the, the that's that's when it really works well together, I think. So. Well, and that's when it's a partnership. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, it is. Yeah. And, you know, that's 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 when good things happen. Right. For both the uh, the buyer and the seller in that case. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, when you talk about shiny objects, um, that's another challenge uh, in the industry um, on both sides. Right. Often mm -hmm. the shiny objects that aren't great for the industry pick up steam because they're easy and quick. Right. Uh, I get oh, Yes. I have a I have a widget. I can push that widget up and move on with my day and say, I innovated today mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, like new concepts. Right. You know me. I'm, I love bringing new concepts to this industry. Uh, but one of the reasons I love it is it's really hard because the industry resists learning oh, yeah. about new concepts um, and uh, there's always the early adopters. There are great hotel organizations that try everything mm -hmm. and listen, they move on from them quickly too, mm -hmm. just as quickly as they try them, but they try everything. Uh, and those tend to be really well put together organizations that are always on the, the front edge of, of innovation in the space. But that's like 12 companies. <laughs> I wouldn't even give them that big number, but I've trusted there's at least 12 that you know of, because for me, yeah, I'm still, there's not a lot of, I can put on one hand that I can think of that I would say. No, it's really, it's 12, it's 12 companies. Um, and, and then you do see things get legs that shouldn't get legs, mm -hmm. right? And it's because, you know, we look at something, it immediately makes sense. So we're like, Okay, cool. Yep, this is a thing now. But the problem is, is if it immediately makes sense, it's probably not being explained to you honestly. Uh, and yeah. you know, there's been a lot of things that have come up in this space that, that have blown up and now are nowhere to be seen. Yeah, right. It's yeah, it, and, and it got, going back to one of my earlier things that I was whining about it, it, the politics of things. When you're making presentations about functionality, service profiles, metrics, and things like this, that's boring stuff. Nobody around a, a, a cocktail table goes and says man you gotta check out my silver pacifica van that is one i mean it's the best vehicle in the world for their family because all the kids fit in it and they can throw a bunch of, but nobody brag no they're bragging about their you know midlife crisis red corvette with the four barrel carburetor on it they, they they have to have this novelty aspect to themselves for bragging rights and it happens in the sea level i think a lot of times it's like oh that's what you guys are oh yeah we're already doing uh chat gpt with some uh blockchain connectivity thing over here <laughs> Uh, hurts, it, it hurts so much it does because yeah. it is it's just about bragging and, and you're right even when doing presentations it's like you have to throw out the sexy words of the day like blah 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 data analytics reporting infrastructure workflow chat gpt okay they're back okay <laughs> you know because they're listening for those little things that uh they want to have that novelty of being able to sit around their 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 peers and say yeah yeah we're in that we're doing that already we got that Right. God, uh, well, it's that stuff. I don't, you know, I can't share that with you. It's, you know, we're in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's top secret. That's a, yeah. I mean, here, we're not going to tell you that. We're just going to brag about the fact that we're doing that kind of stuff. We're doing I mean, it. Yeah. We've, di we've distributed our chat GPT <laughs> over blockchain. Yeah. It's and we're making people pay in crypto for it. <laughs> and it's all served up through augmented reality. Ooh, with some V. Yeah. Some V. I just got in off the of the metaverse. Yeah. It is, it is, yeah, it, 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 and it's the sad part about it because it's really the, the other stuff is the really stuff that needs to get resolved and fixed correctly. Yeah. Anybody in the world, and I've seen this from the property level, they get handed down what has been bought by somebody up. Yep, it doesn't fit anything they have, they don't yep. really truly understand what they're supposed to do with it, except for it's been given to them to do this, and then they have to demonstrate that they're thankful for it because the people said, We gave you these tools, why aren't you using them? Well, it's a hammer, and I need, I need a scalpel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, granted, if I hit hard enough, it'll do what a scalpel does. It's just got a lot more damage. To it it. Does, there's a lot more to it than, yeah, it is. And it's just, and you watch it a lot of times. And, and it, actually, and this is a compliment to everybody that's faced with that square peg round hole mentality. 
the creativeness of somehow trying to hardwire two different things to work together, impressively creative, like how they manually extract data from one thing, put it into another thing so that they can take the data from the other thing and put it to that thing to make the report that they were supposed to do with the first thing to the people that gave it to them, you know, like here, yeah. you know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think the root of a lot of this actually has to do with something I've said multiple times on this show, which is um, most hotels do not communicate to their team what their clear purpose of the hotel is, why their business exists. I would agree. And um, if you don't know why you exist as a business, your employees don't have a true north to measure against mm -hmm. right and um and if you're listening to this and you're like what do you mean why why do we exist we exist for hospitality um no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes but that's not your that's not your yeah. unique purpose yeah. like, it's, it, <laughs> like um you know so like uh, do you exist because you're a lifestyle property serving a specific type of guest for a very specific type of experience those are easy to identify right graduate hotels right like they are they so clearly know who they are and what they're about and who their customer is but that actually exists for every hotel like you mm -hmm. start at the root of the fact that there's a hotel here means the real estate had a purpose that was valuable right all right so then who are you inside of that? Who do you serve? Yes. Because if you can understand this as an organization, vetting and deciding what you focus on, what you do, all of that becomes substantially easier if you know what you're about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, you know, it's funny you say that. I mean, we've had this discussion before, yes, on the show, actually, a lot of times. And I always talk about the fact that any hotel is remotely distant from doing good business and like, we don't even know what we're doing. It was built for a reason at some point. I mean, I've dealt with hotels that were built next to com commerce areas that the commerce area and the hotel is still there. So the, the original core purpose might be gone. And that's when it really comes to the creative, like, what do we do next? But if you don't yeah. even know what value you represent, like who walks in your door, what can you do about that? How can you get more of them and that kind of stuff? You're just sitting there waiting for people that never show up. You have to yeah. understand what you're there for. You're absolutely right. I completely yeah. agree. And, and listen, the challenge of that is, is we're not often in a situation where hotels have to think about these things, because quite honestly, in our industry, we go through 10, 15, 20 year periods of be present to win. And that's mm -hmm. a successful strategy, right? Yeah. Like every year, regardless of what you do, will be better than last for very long runs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I get that it's like, why? <laughs> Why try if that's the case, right? Um, but if you had a vision for your your property, your brand, whatever, um, that also helps fight off complacency. Yes. Yeah. And complacency I'm is the rot of this industry. It's We go through it. We're not in it right now. We're not in a complacency period of time. But it had been, what, 13 years since the last time we were in this phase, like 2008. Eight, yeah. I was looking back at eight and say, okay, how many years have math? And then, <laughs> you know, then, you know, dot com bubble, little blip of 9 11, you know, because 9 11, we recovered pretty quickly as a 96, like 96, 96, yep. yep. Uh, 89, uh, uh, no, 88. Yeah. Like, when was the big real estate crash? That, yeah, was, yeah. And then early 70s before that. I mean, right. Really so we, we tend to go through very extended periods of time where um, it's just easy to just keep doing the same thing over and over again because there's success in that. The problem with that is, is like eventually the, the music stops. Yep. Yep. And the ones who spent the complacency period just not being complacent and really maximizing their their operation and their business and developing their employees and always keeping a foot in progress um they they recover faster when you know, when bringing this ahead. you and i had talked about before and it's interesting in the sense of it's like it's always hard for uh ground level team members to wonder why with everything being as busy as it is that nothing is being improved from that business, that cash flow is there. Why are, why do I still have to work with a computer that literally looks like, you know, built from the 90s uh, kind of thing? 
and they don't understand why there's not a reinvestment into stuff. And that creates a certain frustration because they're not being communicated with. Now, the people above them, having been a part of those conversations, don't feel that talking to them about their financial balancing act that they're performing for their investment right. is something that a line employee should be aware of. That's why they're not investing into stuff because they're literally paying against whatever financial infrastructure they created to it. We're in a very unique position right now that I've had more conversations with clients about their overextension of, budget, of their forecast budget for this year, where they have made it very aggressive. And it's very um, disheartening to see because a lot of people's bonuses and salaries are based on this, this these goals, carrots on a stick stuff, that they're 30% over year over year, but they're 15% high on budget or below on budget because they've been so high on their budgetary expectations even though I, I have to strongly question any executive that forecasted continued hockey stick growth when the entire second half of last year mm -hmm. was every red flag yeah. of economic cooling and disruption. Um, that's not someone who's actually forecasting for success. They're no. forecasting to, to, you know, sell an investor or something. Yep. Um, because if you were smart, you anticipated a bit of a slowdown. And mm -hmm. and I know quite a few organizations who looked at going into this year as, hey, this year probably is going to be what 2020 should have been had COVID not happened, right? Better yep. than 2019, but likely not a continuance of what we saw in 21 and 22. Right. Um, yep. Right, right. Um, so, you know, I that's frightening. It is. It is. And, and, and I have those arguments, well, arguments, lively discussions about, first off, you're already exceeding year over year, but you felt it necessary to even push that line farther out for what you said with financial expectations. Not just that it damages your team's morale because they can, it's a carrot they can never catch, but also it's a, you do know that we're on kind of a wave cycle longer, as you point out, longer wave cycle to things. And if you thought that it was going to be so front loaded that you could make those numbers hit for first quarter, even though it's winter and variabilities and everything else, you're going to run into long term. Can the year actually get hit? And, you know, what happened with lockdown and you and I kind of touched on that. There's been a lot of financial restructuring going on on things, you know, uh, acquisitions of properties and so forth and how they did that financially. And it's it's kind of, you know, all these hotels are doing great with ADR, they're doing great with occupancy and so forth, but they're they're acting like they're going out of business financially, right. you know. Right. It just it, it it's gonna be interesting to see how that all affects the year in the sense of how who owns what pieces to the puzzle at the end of the year for all that financial changes too. Because that it, it does relate to the tech stack issue because that influences whether there's any investment acquisition of stuff. Why, yeah. why are well, I, I mean, I think this year is going to be a weird year, though. Um, I'm already starting to see the very unfortunate um, hotels having to fight off um, balloon payments and um, predatory loans that they had taken because of the raising of interest rates. Uh, and you're already starting to see hotels have to um, literally drop as much expense as they can, even though they're having a better year, year over year than they anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's, I think this year is going to be a weird year where I think demand and, and price is going to be, you know, healthy, respectable. Um, but I still think you're going to see parts of, you know, pockets of hotels, like kind of going into changing hands and, and things like that um, because of the, uh, the interest rates, um, you know, hurting. The other thing I did see is um, timeshare is in a really bad place right now because mm. of interest rates. Right. Mm. So, um, so there are parts of the travel industry that I think are going to have effect on interest rates. Now, if you're a hotel, that's not in that situation. My gosh, like it creates opportunity for you. If your yeah. competitor hotel is cutting investment and marketing and things like that, don't let that frighten you. Uh, like it may be internal, like it may be they're they're in a bad place. Um, but it, it is a weird thing I'm already seeing. We're seeing it here in Orlando. There's a, uh, a, a, a quite a few hotels that are cutting costs because of that, mm -hmm. um, even though they're having record yeah. months. Yeah, it's, it's been kind of interesting because the economy was the first thing about it. I was explaining, uh, I had a conversation come up about chaos theory, you know, butterfly hurricane thing, causation and cause and effect and correlations of those things. And, 
basically at the bottom granular level, depending upon the, the how small the number you're willing to accept, everything causes something yeah. to some degree. Yep. And we've, we've come to be very comfortable with from an economics perspective or from an investment or a financial or business perspective, that there are pretty much consistent patterns of causation, you know, yeah. higher ADRs and so forth, built by financial stability, financial stability, profitability, and that profitability creates better financial ability to purchase and, and all just the typical, but we're seeing these begin to fracture. You just said some hotels are having banner years, but because of what they went through or how they structured it, that's still not good enough. I actually lost a client that was exactly the way you described it. It wasn't a big place, no place, but they had the best year they had ever had in their 24 year history. And they still got sold because financially they couldn't roll the note the way that they needed to. And they had to succumb to giving the hotel to another organization that could carry the note. That's that's sad. Yeah, it is. And it's just sitting there going, wow, you know, it it was people so over and so on. But the reality of the finances of that, like really the hotel had, had been doing the best business that it had ever done. But based on the financial circumstances they ended up being into, they couldn't get past that point. Um, and the banks were willing to do it because, and that goes back to something that you always love pointing out, you know, brands love, uh, banks love brands. <laughs> <laughs> sure do. And they, this wasn't a brand. So getting a bank to go into on it is, you know, yeah. no matter how yeah. good the numbers, it just doesn't seem to push it through, but it is. So anyways, like, I, I, yeah, I think we, I, I took you off path here, though. Yeah. You, you, you know, what was the purpose of talking about the, the shiny object stuff? Because we're, we're I've d- definitely. No, no, I appreciate that. that. I mean, because it really actually relates back to the fact of, of why, there, why tech stacks in, in hospitality in general, just be generic about it, uh, are broken is because there's mm-hmm. too many outside influences that actually don't solve the real value is just of looking at a tech stack from a collaborative, integrated capacity. And instead, they look at it from a fractional departmental hoarding preferences, yep. political influences that create this camel out of a horse request. Um, because, if you know, Definitely. whoever wrote that check, loved those people, wanted that platform that doesn't deal with this person that wrote this check for this platform that they had responsibility <laughs> for. And yeah. now somebody is supposed to be responsible in the middle and all they're doing is getting browbeated by both sides and say, why can't you make this work? Yeah. And, you know, so yeah. that's kind of where it was. That's where the shiny object came from, because a lot of times, you know, uh, I, I heard a discussion uh, recently about uh, electronic keys and how innovative that is. Oh, my God. That's three years ago, four years, ago, five years. It's been a long conversation. And yes, they are uh, more prevalent today. But I still remember when Hilton announced it and they had it in what, three hotels? Yeah. You know, it, it, that that that. Uh, to be the person to say that they did it, but really it's not to scale. Well, now electronic keys as hardware gets well, more functional. I actually think for that though, is I think they were trying to create the problem it created, which is pressure on ownership that guess it dissatisfaction oh, yeah. occurs because you didn't do this thing. Right. Yes. Like um, I don't think that was a misstep for Hilton. Oh, I, I mean, and for the purposes that they did, the, 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 yeah, no, no, absolutely. Announcing it early actually was a pretty smart ploy. Because it created, uh, you know, because consumers like it was a nicety, right? Like no one was like, I am not staying at a hotel that doesn't let me use my phone as a key. Like no one was saying that, right? They were saying, hey, it's cool when that happens. Yes. So Hilton did the, hey, this is what we got. It's in the honors app. Go to town. Yeah. And then that set an expectation that you were going to get that. Even though it had all the right disclaimers that it wasn't going to be at every hotel, but yeah. basically they got the traveler to be mad at the hotel owner for not having it, uh, which, you know, now look at what percentage of their portfolio has yes. it. It's, it's, that was, well, sorry, you know, again, I, I took you, I took you on a side. No, no, but it's exactly, you know. but the idea of it is, is that the conversations of what's considered to be worthy of discussion now aren't the same as that were three years ago, obviously, but they're, they seem to be in perpetuation minus the peppering in of buzzword stuff. And, right. and uh, it, yeah, it, I mean, and, and that is something I, I, I do want to say is, is um, you will never hear anyone that actually knows what they're doing, giving like huge praise to things that are 10 or 15 years away. They may nod to it. They may talk about it's worth looking at and experimenting. But anyone who gets up on stage and like goes deep into why the hospitality industry should be, you know, considering blockchain does not at all know how the industry works. Like 
there's, there's just, I, and I'm sorry if I'm offending someone who did this, but like, I'm to sorry because I know who you're talking. About. <laughs> to the people who know, to the people who know, <sighs> like to the to the smart people in the room, they're going, "Why on earth is our industry talking about doing something with this in the short term?" Yeah. Like when we can't even do email correctly, right? Yeah. Like, and we can't, we can't, you know, have high functioning e-commerce funnels, right? Like, uh, so, so, and why I say that is it's one thing to talk about it and open the dialogue and oh, have yes. vision yes. conversations. Like, so please don't take me as like anyone who goes up on stage and says chat GPT, oh, it doesn't no. know what they're talking about. That's not what I'm saying. But if anyone's up on stage saying, we are deploying chat GPT as a core strategy this year. No, like there, the, the, there's no, no. <laughs> or makes a keynote out of blockchain. Just say. It. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and why I say that is, is uh, to what I saw you talking about before I texted you, which is if you don't have your house in order, like you can't be doing things like this. Mm -hmm. Like you, you really, you can't. Um, and you can't, you can't develop something if you're not going to do right by it. Right. So that's, that's my other thing. Like, is, you know, you see, a you see um, companies often go down this path of building stuff and it's kind of insulting because it's like building the first version of anything is actually really easy. It's continuing to yes. make it good is the very difficult part of building any technology. And mm -hmm. listen, you know, there's a reason like all the brands are starting to go to third parties now for their CRSs and PMSs and after decades of being on, yep. you know, a core system that they built. And it's because eventually your business, which is not focused on technology, is not going to correctly invest <laughs> in the project and it will quickly turn from that was a great move for us to that's the thing that's sinking our ship. Um, and so, you know, kind of talking to that is get your house in order doesn't mean you have to be innovative and on everything new. It just should be be really good at everything you do. Mm -hmm. It's true. Oop. Yeah. Did you lose oh, me? Uh, no, no, I got you. No, I was. Did I it freak it. you out that I paused to allow you? Yeah, to I was like, what? Like, you oh, you're like Ed must be frozen. There's no way Ed paused. <laughs> no, to let you know, Ed talk. paused. Holy crap, that was from emphasis and point. But yes, it is very true, and it is one of those things. And I, I touted about Stewie, uh, Stewart, excuse me, Stewart Butler, uh, omnipotent man of Myrtle Beach, the king of all that he for is overseas, you know, and all that. But no, he. He always was the one that when I was all geeking out and passionate about new innovative ways of plugging widgets into widgets, he's like, it's great. Did you do all the other stuff first? <laughs> so he, he's the one that really drove it home and you were echoing the same thing. It's like, that's great. It's being done. And to your point, they're not even doing good emails correctly yet. They're not even doing right. good engagement. Life. They're not even do, do any good workflow for anything, really. They, they're all about waiting till the person is ready to make a decision to purchase and everybody's crowding that one spot. You know, they're not building the relationship. They're not maintaining the relationship. It's it's very, very true. And so I guess in that sense, when I see and hear from people that talk about that, that the content that's beginning to be shared, I, I, I've, I'm very apprehensive about the upcoming conference circuit stuff as to what's really going to get presented. Oh, it's going to all be chat GPT. You know it is. It's just, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all going to be buzzword X and buzzword Y and chat GPT is the big buzzword. It's like, what are you doing with chat GPT? Is chat GPT your feature for this? What kind you know, with content, so forth and so on. It's like, yeah, it's a fun toy, but other toys that are better. Honestly. But listen, it's, it's AI is now getting to a point where it's starting to get really commercially interesting. Chat yes. GPT as an AI is commercially interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I gotta be honest for you, it's not for the hotel industry to do themselves. No, no, not like, at all. Be, like, cause first things first, AI is not ready for prime time yet. Mm -hmm. You can't just let it loose and leave it free to interact with your customers unmonitored, right? Yeah. So AI is good at augmenting um, repetitive tasks, you know, at making your staff, you know, more capable of being efficient, things like that. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the industry is excited about it because they see what AI could be 
mm-hmm. 10, 15 years from now, which is I don't have to do these things anymore because AI is going to do it for me. Um, that kind of talking to that too, I do chuckle at um, our industry. Like I, I'm hearing a lot of hotels talk about that they have AI personalization in place. <laughs> and um, you, you may have it in place. It's not doing anything um, mm-hmm. because to do true personalization, the automation of like what conversation to have with someone is actually not the unmovable mountain. That's actually pretty easy to build. It's the actual amount of variation in content yes. that you need to have and the quality of data of the person you're engaging with that you need to have in order for that to actually yes. do something meaningful. Um, so if you're talking about AI personalization and you know that personalization is like, you know, I move you from automate like nurture point A to nurture point B, that's that's not really AI personalization. That's just marketing automation. That's basic mm-hmm. stuff. It's workflow. It's, um, uh, yeah, a- AI it's personalization is, hey, we have tens of thousands of pieces of content. We have data points uh, that we understand in consumer behavior that if they hit this data point trigger, this will trigger a personalization cascade. And that every step along the way, as they touch that, it's going to fine tune and change and fine tune and change and fine tune. That's AI personalization. No one's doing that yet in our space, um, like at all. Uh, There are technologies capable of handling that. However, to do it right, your content library and your data scale need to be huge. I think you're the one that told me this, that the there's two ways of approaching your customization. And I think this goes back a long conversation ago. What you're aware of at the point of engagement or what you have to discover from the point of engagement on. And what you just described, where people try to tie up themselves as AI, is they create a workflow of conditional relationship. But what you want. So I'm going to give you the options to choose from to better clarify what I need to give in response. That's a workflow. That's a point of inception forward of engagement. The part that I think that you could point to that people try to think and imply is there is what out of all that has happened up to the point of engagement am I aware of of you? Your preferences, right. your personalities, your engagements, your interests, your, your, your histories, all the things that are tangible gatherings of data. And they are massive in their variations until they get down to the point of where they're now by inception contacting to move forward on something. And, and you know, from a brilliant side of what you're doing on your stuff, that is the part that is the hardest because you really have to make sure that you react to their engagements or their interactions to a point of, of getting more data to clarify them as a... Per- well, and you need to change what you engage them with. The current, you know, kind of journeys of the industry are not equipped to learn what you need to learn from your traveler to be able to personalize an experience for them, right? Like, sure, you can do the basics, but even the basics aren't being done well. Like, you know, you you look at all the missed opportunities in the flow that we have today. uh, And and a lot of that is because we only think in all or nothing, right? Um, Every hotel website is book now or don't. So- Well, what percentage book now? It's like maybe 1%. Good hotels, maybe 2%. (laughs) Um, The rest don't. So you're, you know, 150 room hotel. How many bookings are you actually getting a month? 400 bookings through your website, 500, you know, bookings through your website. You know, when you look at the scale of, you know, that's 1% generally of the people who visited your website, you didn't learn about the majority of the people you interacted with. So what are you possibly personalizing if you don't know anything about 98, 99% of the people that you're interacting with? There's nothing to personalize there. I have a statistic that was shared in a recent presentation that said that 68% of all sales and travel and tourism are made online in 2022. Yeah, including OTA. (laughs) 
not seen the one it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In- including OTA, yeah. I, including I everybody that. that's, that's basically standing in front of you in line for the whole process. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, yeah. So, I mean, but th- this is my point. Like, it's good that we talk about these things. Mm-hmm. But if you want to be part of that gang talking about it, also spend time thinking about how do we get there? How do we use AI personalization? What value does it bring? And are we in a position where the investment to get to how we should be using it makes sense to the economics of a hotel? Mm -hmm. Right? Like that's, these are the the big things. Uh, The other thing I'll say to you though, too, is like, if you don't have scale, AI is not for you. Mm -mm. But it doesn't mean you can't build really good marketing because you can fake personalization pretty well Right, it's absolutely it's, it's to your benefit. You're not large. Because yeah, if you know your large, customers. Yeah. yeah, if you know your customers and you know them well and you know how to classify them and how to look for them, you can build really nice engagement mm-hmm. that will be really great without AI. AI yeah. is for scale. Like AI is not for small scale. Like there, mm-hmm. there's very little benefit in AI if you don't have scale data and scaled content ai helps you make big things little Mm -hmm. right so my joke has always been ai makes big data little yeah it's a very good very true statement uh also ai my biggest benefit of ai is ai makes trademark data or trademark images and music yours (laughs) because you make your own (laughs) yeah 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 um so so you know um I think with the shiny object stuff, experiment. But Mm -hmm. experiment means actually try to not just do it, try to understand it, try to understand why is this an opportunity? What does this opportunity mean to me as a personal career development and to the organization I work for? Um, and, And, you know, then understand, can I do this incredibly well? Um, You know, that's, that's the stuff. Right. That's the stuff mm-hmm. that I think we need to focus on. Um, and then also remember anyone going up on stage that's presenting you education, like just do some research to see is there an agenda to this mm-hmm. education? Right. Like, because I mean, they work for the company that they're talking about doing services. At I'm their- not even talking about that. <laughs> I mean, personal development agendas. Right. Like, sure. many a times there have been people who've blown through this industry doing big things. And just before those things actually have to like launch and happen, they change jobs, but they're up on stage talking constantly about that big thing and how it's going to be the next big thing. And I got to tell you guys, there's no silver bullet. Mm -mm. There's no silver bullet to what you're trying to run as a business. There is no cheat code. There is no shortcut. Um, You have to know why you're in business and what you should be doing. And then you have to make sure you're doing those things. If you do that, that's the secret. Do the basics really well, experiment with new things, and then figure out if they deserve a place in your permanent toolkit. And if they don't move on from them, like go like do that. That's fine. Um, You know, that's my advice on shiny objects. Try it out. Try to understand it. Talk about it all you want. But, you know, just remember, like, if you're trying shiny things more than you are focusing on the problems and the flaws in your your current business, the shiny things aren't going to carry you over the edge. No, no. And I guess it also goes to one of the things I was going to throw about the tech stack stuff, too. Sometimes things get implemented to the benefit of having it been done rather than to the success that is actually measured. Like, yeah. oh, we have that on there. Oh, how's it helping you? Well, it's just doing it. No, it's not. It's, it's a, doing things and stuff. It's stuff. It's doing stuff. Hey, and now you're, that vendor, that vendor tells me those things and stuff. It's doing some money. really the numbers they amazing. Yeah. yeah. By the way, you give me the topic for the next show. Cake cake trays. How many colors are really required? 
<laughs> ah, yes. Dude, you have a seriously excellent collection of cake trays. This is this is not my office. I am working from home because my daughter is sick. Oh, no. uh, this is my wife's office, and she is a event planner. And this is what an event planner's office looks like, which is cake trays. And I tell I'm you what, there, I'm surrounded by. I didn't even know existed. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, and that's this is just the stuff that looked good on the shelf. On the shelf, right? I can only imagine the stuff that there's, isn't. There's a, there's a lot more of these, and then her shop has a oh. insane amount of them. So yes, uh, this is. Uh, this is different. It's got a different vibe than my it does. Marvel this is not an ed vibe. Yeah, this is not yeah, an ed vibe. Yeah. This is this is a, you know, yeah. The, I'm, I'm first. The, uh, I'm, the colors and the sizes are just impressive for all here, things. I'll give you. A, I'll give you what I look at when I sit at her desk. Oh yeah, <laughs> which is. <laughs> oh. Is so, Todd around? Is Todd around? Todd's Todd's hasn't been done yet. He's uh, uh he, he's he's not he's not been around long enough to get to get his uh, portrait done as a character. And then all the pictures uh, surrounding that are of the insane birthday parties my wife threw for each of the kids throughout the years. So uh, um, awesome. yes, this is a. Her office is much bigger than mine. Is I was about to say she's got a little bit more space going on. Yeah, this is a pretty a, big room. I, yeah, this I'm, is this I'm is a little a, bit larger than your your workspace. Just say I'm not afforded as much space. No, no, um, no, no. You don't get the yeah. privilege of the space. But yeah, exactly. Oh, well, dude. listen. Thanks for letting me hijack. Oh uh, no, I am today. absolutely. I loved it that you heard was peeked in and you had something to jump on. I appreciate the hell out of it. You know that. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> hey. Oh yeah, well. Yeah. Since we were talking around it anyway, and for those that don't know who you are, if that's even possible oh. these days, Ed. Oh, it's very possible. <laughs> uh, so I'm Ed Saint Ange. I'm the uh, president of Flip Two. Uh, we build uh, marketing software for hotels and destinations and brands. Um, Pretty much, I mean, it's a pretty big ar architecture, but it all focuses on the same thing, which is getting you into conversations with as many travelers as possible to drive truly direct bookings, not just trying to avoid OTAs, but also trying to avoid Google and Facebook and having to constantly pay them. Uh, and I've been in this industry for a long time. Uh, I built the first channel manager for the industry back in the early 2000s. Uh, that's now Travel Clicks uh, company. They bought it from me uh, and uh, been a long time friend with Lauren. And we get to we get to work a lot together. We get to work uh, a lot I, together and have I fun love. together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, and, I feel, I feel yeah. like I get to see a peek at the future every time I get to see all the crazy stuff you're doing. So well, listen, we're trying to do hard things, right? Like, you know, I I, I practice what I preach. I don't mm. build stuff that is you know weak. <laughs> I try to solve real problems, and the real problems of our industry are technically difficult to solve. I would say out of all things, you listen to what needs to be heard in that sense of doing, fixing the things that, yeah. Anyways, yes. And it's awesome that you're back and at least be able to pop on the show for here that you had a free up of time because uh, I do know how busy you actually are. <laughs> <laughs> and I do. I need chat GPT to automate. Oh, job. you know, and that's, that's, that's I think it. we use it two more times. We're going to get indexed completely different for the show because the word will be used, you know, Heels three times and we automatically get higher rankings because we use yeah. the word chat like GPT. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, like Beetlejuice will just be pop up. But I do hope your daughter feels better. I didn't realize she Thank wasn't you. well. Just a cold, like you know, but it's you know, it's nobody wants to be alone cold. when they have a cold, nobody wants to go do anything when they have a cold. It's good when they exactly have so yeah. exactly. So but thanks for uh thanks for letting me pop ah, on. Uh, this it. was a fun conversation. I gotta go get ready for my uh my one o'clock call now. Now um, the real job but, comes back. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. I got to go do real <laughs> things and, and not just rant and tell people how they should do things where yes. everything I'm saying you should do is incredibly difficult to actually do. So exactly. don't think I, don't think that's not lost on me that I know the advice <laughs> I'm giving is not simple. Uh, no, that's true. No, but, but it is truthful because you do practice what you preach. There, That is for sure. sure. So anyways, thank you, sir. Good to thank see you, you as Mr. always. Great Have to a see wonderful you. weekend. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Talk to All you right. soon. Have a great yeah. weekend. Bye-bye. Well, that was awesome. I love, I love talking with Ed. Ed is uh, probably one of the things in the transition of shortening the show and so forth and so on is we don't get the opportunity to grab so many guest speakers as much, but I always love when they can join. Uh, for transcriptions of this and replay of this, obviously, we'll be doing 1130 a.m. Sydney, Australian time for our APAC friends, 1130 a.m. Wednesday, UK, uh, London time for our EU friends and Middle East friends. 
Uh, of course, you can always catch us forever on I Love Lucy reruns at the hospitalitychannel.tv. We hope that you uh, have the chance to watch us live on your own TV because we have a TV channel called the Hospitality Channel. You can get that on Roku, Google, Amazon, or Apple. Just look for the Hospitality Channel where the show is always on the free side of that. Um, and of course, our Hospitality Marketing Club. If you're a hospitality marketing professional, you want to work with or collaborate with peers, ask questions, have open discussions, non-competitively share ways of doing things better in real time, real functional things, you can join us at hospitalitymarketing.club. Just put your email in. I'll send you an address. I'll send you a quiz. Pass the quiz to show proficiency, and I'll send you an invite. You can join the club and have conversations with peers. So with that, my name is Lauren Gray. I sincerely appreciate the privilege of your time, and I look forward to catching you all next week. Till then, have a very safe and happy weekend and week. Bye. -bye.